Okay, good evening and welcome to the public session of the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, December 1st, 2015. We'll start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is the opening of the public session of the board's meeting. We met early tonight in executive session where we discussed strategy with respect to litigation uh, regarding Jane Doe versus the town of Hopkinton and Star Eversource uh, as well because an open meeting may have had a detrimental effect on litigation position of the board. And we conducted strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel relative to the fire chief and town manager. I want to report that as part of that, the board voted um, uh, to award the fire chief a one and three quarter percent raise for fiscal year 2016. We had uh, previously overlooked this when we completed his review, and so we took that action tonight and um, made him whole. And that's obviously retroactive back to first of the fiscal year. Mr. Chair, is that a vote that we need to do in public session as well? Please forget it. Sure. So, uh, so Chair, I entertain a motion uh, in public session as well to um, award the fire chief a one and three quarter percent. Uh, merit-based raise for fiscal year 2016. So moved. Motion. Second. Second for the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? President not voting. That's unanimous. So the, the vote in public is also unanimous, Mr. Kamala. Uh, now as part of the uh, open session, we will start off with um, public session. Uh, anyone who'd like to come in and make any comments uh, is uh, welcome to come forth. Do we have anyone here for public session this evening? We do. Right on. Come on up. Oh, man, we don't usually get this kind of a crowd. So, <laughs> all right, so welcome. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, start off by introducing yourself, name and address, and then um, everybody gets two minutes to, to say whatever they like. My name's Jim Sullivan. I live at 18 Huckleberry Road. Hi. Should we all introduce ourselves? LJ sure, Del please. L.J. Del Ponte, 20 Huckleberry Road. Rob Scanavan, 26 Huckleberry Road. Right. And Jennifer Belisi, 24 Huckleberry Road, also on the Board of Health. I sense a Huckleberry Road theme tonight. Yes. So. <laughs> Uh, we're here because of the uh, flooding on the Whitehall Brook uh, caused by beavers. Uh, we went to the Board of Health meeting last night, and they kind of agreed that there's a, a situation there. And we're looking to, to basically where should we go from here. Okay. Um, this, is the, this ties into the, to the Pratt Farm property too, right, doesn't this? Go ahead. Yes, that is correct. Um, it's an issue that has been brought to our attention. We have asked the relevant town departments to review this issue and work collaboratively uh, towards a solution. Mm -hmm. we've, you know, we've had this going on on the other side of town a fair bit, actually, for a while. Um, that South Mill or North Yeah, North? over there, there's been a lot of beaver issues. And I think what we've done is, what have we done? We've basically had, uh, there's really very few solutions because of things. Isn't that it the state? That that yeah, ends the up sta isn't it the state yeah, issue? You have to get rid of them? So we understand that there's a lot of moving pieces in the Whitehall Brook, which is part of the Sudbury River, is yeah. under Mass DEP. However, it does now border on the town property. And um, in discussions with Jamie this week, you know, we understand that we all bought property that borders upon the Whitehall Brook. However, we did not buy properties that were flooded. And today um, I went not only as a Board of Health member, but because certainly where our leaching fields will have a certain contamination possibility at this point due to the proximity of the flooding that's going on there. Um, I didn't realize that my leaching field was actually the closest to the Whitehall Brook because everybody's leaching fields are in front of their house and mine's in the rear. So, and my property actually goes five acres all the way back on the Whitehall Brook. So there is state responsibility. There are There is local input that we require because of the, the proximity to now town on Pratt Farm. Um, but there's also some an urgency to this. We understand that, you know, there's no line item in a budget for beaver mitigation. Um, and it seems almost silly to say it out loud. But it's a real concern for us because when we're talking about contamination or possible contamination, where do we go from there? So we want to fix this, but realize we, 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 just because we own the property doesn't mean we can do anything about it. You can't, you can't just go out and shoot beavers, right? So, so well, we can't go out and shoot beavers. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, so don't, right, right, we're in a butter to you. We're not, we're not exactly. the cause, and we can't fix it even if we want to. It's really, it has to go, I think it's historically, it's always gone to the Board of Health, right? Yes. So the Board of Health did make a recommendation last night in full support disclosing that, of course, I'm, an, you know, I own property on this um, as well, that, you know, something has to be done, that we have to move to, and their recommendation was to actually come before the Board of Selectmen to say, listen, 
the Board of Health is here, we also don't have a line item to mitigate the situation. It's not only getting rid of the beavers, it's, it's unlocking those dams. So where do we go from here? Mo money is the least of the issue here because you can't just go knock that stuff down. Okay, well, I'm I mean, so so that. that's not, it's not a financial issue at all. They're just kicking the can over to us because they don't know what to do. But I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not a, it's not just, you know, you need so I just money heard to, that there, to, it was not a financial well, issue, right? I don't, I don't think it's money, right? I think it's just the ability to do it. The process. It's, it's a process. It's a water, it's a watershed. You know, it's so, DPW, it, Mass it's a protected DPW. species. Yeah, species. You know, you yeah, got. Yeah. And this is. So, I think what we're requesting is where do we go from here? And I, I, I know that we had Jamie's seen pictures that we forwarded along to the. The pictures don't even do justice to to how close it is to. The, the water is less than 40 feet from my house. Lack of appreciation for situations is not also not the problem here. It's just it's just how do we figure it out? What I would say is what you should do is is get with the town manager, and and again it, this has to go to the state really as far as I understand from in the distant past hearing about this across town. Mr. Kamal shouldn't really isn't there, I think that what they need to do is sit down with you one on one and we need to talk about you, you know how to how to sort of move this up at the state level right because isn't that the only one that can resolve this? That is correct. Uh, again we. We have contacted the relevant town departments, asked them to review the issue. Uh, we were not aware of the outcome from last night's meeting. Um, so we will ask the, the town teams to meet as quickly as possible. And, and the concern being that it hasn't even snowed yet I get and it, it hasn't thawed. I get it. Right. I mean, I, I, I get it. I, I, it. Just, you know, again, we, we have no jurisdiction over So we beavers. will follow up with your office we'll to arrange you. a meeting. As Does quickly as possible. As quickly as possible. Great. Okay. We'll pay attention. We'll, Jamie, we'll I'll write. call your office tomorrow and we'll schedule something. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Okay, that crisis narrowly averted. We move on to the consent agenda. Um, uh, we have uh, only one item on the consent agenda, to, actually two items on the consent agenda tonight. One day liquor license. The board consider approving a, a following, the following one day liquor license. Proponent is Tara Sandra, Hopkinton Parent Teacher Association fundraiser, the Holiday House Torn Boutique. The date and time, the first date is December 5th, 2015 from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then the second one is December 6th, 2015 from 12 to 4, location 10 Cobblers Way. There's some comments. The second item is a Veterans District Agreement Renewal. It's an action item. The board will consider reauthorizing the town of Hopkinton as a member of the Metro West Veterans Services Agreement. Would anyone like to break either of those items up? Okay. Uh, Chair, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. So moved. Any motion and a second? Um, actually, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I should have broken it out if I'm going to have questions on it. I know. It, but We're now uh, on two item consent agendas. We should just do individually. Because um, we always end up breaking them out. Would you like me to break it out or ask Go for it. What do you want? Now? I don't care. Break out number one, please. Okay. So let's just, let's just take them in order. So the Holiday House in Boutique, what's your question, Mr. Um, my question is uh, HPD is looking for any liquor being ser any liquor server being tip certified. Is this something where this is going to be HPTA people uh, who are serving the alcohol or is there a caterer coming in that's tip certified? I believe Vin Bin will be in charge of saving liquor. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. So, yeah, go so ahead. Through the chair, I just make a point. So, so on these alcohol things, almost every time they come up, we ask about the tips certification. The chief has there, you know, as long as they adhere to the stipulation. But that leaves the opening for them not adhering to the stipulation. If could we just have it as a requirement that they're tip certified, period, or it just doesn't make it to us? It seems like the form should be yes. These, yes or no. these three things that are, the chief always has to type. Yeah. I think we'll take that point under advisement, review it with the police chief, and determine the best procedure for the town. Right. Maybe the permit can say it or something going forward. <laughs> okay. That's it. Thank you. I'm good. <laughs> good. Chair, I'll a motion to approve the one-day liquor license. So moved. So second. second. Second for the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, present, not voting. That's unanimous. Second item is a veterans district agreement. Do, uh, any questions on this? Same as, same as Mr. Kamalo, no changes? Same exact thing? No changes. You broke it out except well. for the new office down in Holliston. Right. Okay. Uh, Chairman, I a motion to approve the veterans district agreement. So moved. Second. For the discussion? 
All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Present not voting. That's also unanimous. Next item on the agenda, Charter Review Commission member appointments and action item. The board will consider appointing a representative to the Charter Review Commission. Um, unless we have a volunteer, I'd actually recommend we postpone this to the next meeting. There's a there's another meeting on Friday with some of the other folks to um, to talk about the applicants. So does anybody have a burning desire to be on this regardless, or would you rather wait? I'd like to be involved in it, but if other if someone else on the board would like to be involved, I'm willing to, you know, be open to that too. I mean, if it's a board member, I'd be fine with doing it. But we'll end up appointing a board member, right? Like, isn't that one of the? Well, no, we we get to appoint a member. It doesn't have to be a board right. member. Yeah, I, I personally think that the board should be represented directly, uh, you know, by by a member. Of the so board. let's talk about this. Do you want a motion, or do you just want to have a discussion? Well, let's talk about it, and then we can go to a motion if we if we do. There are there are, there are a number of other, uh, 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 and I'm fine with that. I just just, just I'm, to I'm have the facts on the table. I'm fine waiting because I believe that there might be some interest on Mr. Hur's part. So I'm I'm fine with waiting. Or That's or one is he's not here. The second one, is, and I'm not saying this would count against it, but just we all have all the facts. There are a number of other applicants who put their names in. And so the question is, would we want to consider, do we just believe philosophically we should just have a selectman, in which case we just pick among us? In which case that doesn't matter. But just I just want to make sure everyone knows that there are other applicants and that it will be considered by the other folks who get to appoint somebody. So I'm fine with this either way. If you really want it, I'm fine. Are applications if, being uh, accepted just on a general basis for all the seats that what we've done is solicited solicited anybody that wants to be in part of the charter commission charter review commission put their name in mm -hmm. and then what happens is uh, because there's so many different bodies um, uh, you know everyone there's a bunch of different people can pick people mm -hmm. so there's uh, there's certainly multiple other cho choices because the moderator gets two and the town clerk gets two and the school committee gets one the school committee already picked a school committee member mm -hmm. so um, so to your point, um, I guess I, I'm fine. I'm fine either way. I think I'd, I think it would be nice to see if Mr. Hurd wanted to participate. That's fine. But, um, um, That's fine. Uh, you know, if you want it, you can get a motion going. I think you'd be great at that. I just figured out a deference. We should be nice. To yeah. No, and I'm here. fine with okay. that. I'm fine. Right, with but that. I would like to have a board member on there. Okay. okay. So I think philosophically we're gonna we're gonna go with a board member, and so I'll let you two to duke it out. Right. Okay. So I'm gonna push that to the next meeting. Can we have that on the 15th agenda, please? Okay, the next one, oh, tonight's fun event, police department promotions, right on time. <clears throat> the board will consider, and I want to make sure consider, uh, uh, promoting <laughs> Sergeant Joseph Bennett and Sergeant John Porter as new lieutenants of the Hockenden Police Department. Chief, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> exactly. So, I was going to introduce right. them. Uh, gentlemen. <laughs> This is Mr. Kamalo, <laughs> Chief. I know. Okay. Uh, my plan was to uh, do a little introduction, uh, explain the process we went through, and then move on by uh, presenting one at a time for you to grill. Right? I know. <laughs> it's an exciting day for the uh, Hopkinton Police Department. This is the first time in the history of the department that we have two candidates up for the rank of lieutenant. Uh, the first position was recently created. Uh, as uh, we looked at the police department and saw the needs. Uh, the second one is a replacement for the uh, imminent retirement of Lieutenant Chuck Wallace, who is sitting over there. Uh, he's not gone yet, but uh, he's still got a, a good month with him. But I would like to take the time and recognize Lieutenant Wallace, who for the last 30 years has displayed dedication to excellence and public service for the town of Hopkinton. Whether working with town officials, fellow officers, town residents, and yes, even prisoners. <laughs> Regardless of the hat he worn, throughout his career, he has always treated everyone with the utmost dignity and respect. Leading by example, he has mentored many officers through his career, and tonight's promotion of these two is a perfect example of it. With that being said, I would like to thank Lieutenant Walsh for his service to the town of Hopkinton and the Hopkinton Police Department. As uh, part of the process, uh, we formed an oral board utilizing the recommendations of the Board of Selectmen. Serving on this board were HR Director Maria Casey, 
Owen Mag Mag excuse me, Madgen from the Personnel Committee, uh, Chief Gary Chamberlain from the Sterling Police Department, and uh, one of our most experienced and knowledgeable police officers, Officer Tom Griffin. Uh, I want to thank all of you that took part. If, uh, if uh, I think just Maria is here tonight, but taking time out of the busy <laughs> schedule and doing an extremely professional job. Uh, they uh, conducted a uh, interview. They met uh, a couple days in advance and uh, took a lot of time into it. And um, they did an intensive interview. Uh, I was aware of the questions after, so I know how, how intensive it was, but I kind of stayed out of the whole picture. And we had four extremely ca qualified candidates. Uh, they were presented to me, uh, the two that rose to the top, and those are the two in front of you here tonight. Uh, excuse me, Sergeant, not Lieutenant yet, Joe Bennett, and Sergeant John Porter. Uh, I certainly concurred with their recommendation. Uh, after working with both candidates and being knowledgeable of their leadership style, training, education, and exper experience, as well as both their skill sets. And now I'm here to recommend uh, both to the board for promotion. Let me start with Sergeant Joe Bennett. Sergeant Joe Bennett came to the Hopton Police Department in 1993 after serving with the Southborough and Sutton Police Department. He has served patrol, detectives, and has been sergeant for 16 years. Currently, Sergeant Bennett is the court prosecutor in charge of detectives, communications, and the school resource officer. You can see why we need a, an extra lieutenant. <laughs> he also serves as the public information officer. Additionally, Sergeant Bennett is assigned as the grant administrator and has been awarded over $1 million in grant, uh, grant funds. These funding opportunities have brought funding for equipment, training, overtime, hiring of personnel, and most notably the school resource program which was created under federal funding for the hiring of two police officers to backfill the assignments of the new SROs. Sergeant Bennett was instrumental in the creation of the consolidation of the public safety dispatch and worked on all facets of the implementation, including budgeting, hiring, training, and policy development. Sergeant Bennett is a member of the Boston Marathon executive planning team. His primary responsibility for the security plan and uh, deployment of internal and external resources. This collaboration brings hundreds of officers from 63 agencies, including seven states seven and seven federal agencies. He holds a master's degree in criminal justice administration from Western New England College and has uh, received a high level of training, including Roger Williams University mid-level management course and has received the FBI LEADA Trilogy Award. Wow. A lot of stuff. <laughs> while assigned as detective, uh, while, while assigned as a detective sergeant, he received recommend, uh, excuse me, recognition from the Massachusetts House of Representatives for his work on the Tri-County Drug Task Force. He has also been recognized by Mothers Against Drivers for his work in preventing drunk driving. In 2009, Sergeant Bennett received the Hopkinton Police Department Materia Service Award for actions taken when a man armed with a knife attempted to stab him. The man was taken into custody without serious injuries and to, to him or fellow officers. Sergeant Bennett is a dedicated professional with proven leadership, interpersonal, and communicational skills. He is creative and continues to bring creative ideas to fruition through teamwork and results-based leadership. He has an ex extensive track record of progressive responsibility and accumulated accomplishments resulting in the improved departmental effectiveness and the enhanced quality of the life of the community. Sergeant Bennett. Hello. Greetings. Welcome. Exciting to be here tonight. Thank you for, for the opportunity. <clears throat> I wouldn't, I, I see all the people in the room and I know that if it wasn't for the support that I've gotten from my bosses and leaders, if fo both formal and informal leaders, uh, I, this wouldn't be possible. I've been fortunate to be surrounded by many, many good people that I work with and foremost my wonderful family. I can't thank them enough for enduring lots of nights away from home while at work. And uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm blessed to be here and I'm thankful. Great. All right. Well, thank you for coming in. I think we're somewhat familiar with you. But uh, let's, uh, let's go to the board and see if anybody wants to take one last shot. Mr. Mosier. Joe, what drew you to Hockington? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You've been fast-tracked, only sergeant for uh, 16 years, or you've been here 16 years. 
Yes. So uh, I, I'm thrilled to see you get this position. I know how much you care about the town, how hard you've worked for it, and you truly deserve it. And I believe you have the respect of your peers. You certainly have our respect. And um, just a quick comment, I, I guess in light of uh, some of the media attention that law enforcement has drawn, I have every confidence uh, that, that we're under good care here. So I'm, I'm congratulating you on your position. Thank you, Mr. Moden. Mrs. Sestari. Just wondering what kind of a nut job would lunge at you with a knife, even if you didn't have a knife. <laughs> <coughs> he was having a bad day. <laughs> I got worse, I bet. You got worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joe, you know, since I've been here, I've, I've heard everything that you've done for the department and the community uh, just in a, in a uh, more recent history perspective. Uh, but then hearing the chief list off your accomplishments through your career is even more impressive. Um, glad you're glad you're on our team. Uh, glad to have you in the community, and I wish you all the best uh, and congratulations on this promotion. Thank you, Mr. Sestari. Mr. Catino. Congratulations. It's 16 years that you, you've you've put in your you've put in definitely put in your time. I just want to. Are you going to continue doing the grant writing? Yeah, bringing in a million bucks is good. I want to make sure that that we continue that pipeline. And just so you know, the uh, the town manager brings in. It's, no it's pressure, no. that's something that's you know there, there's always money out there, and it's great to, that you can find it for us. And uh, and and the community policing with the you know, the SRO and all that. That's it's just fabulous the way that that works in this town. That we don't uh, we didn't have to go the militarization of our police force. That we actually. Uh, try and um, prevent crime be, uh, at the beginning. Absolutely. We're all proud of our relationship with the community, and, and these guys work every day to protect it. Great job. Congratulations. Thank you. Good. All right. Well, the, we're going to seem like a bunch of pushovers here, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, everything they said I agree with. It, it's great to see you here. I'm, I couldn't be happier uh, under any circumstance. I think the process was really well done. Chief, congratulations to everybody that did this. Um, uh, I think we've really... Um, uh, I think we've shown that we can really grow some great folks inside the police department and, um, and move them up. And, and so I'm, I'm very happy here tonight. So uh, I have no questions. Um, what I'd like to do would be, uh, since you and Jay came together, I guess I'd like to sort of vote the whole thing at the end. So um, if we can sure. maybe move on and, and, um, and hear about the next potential plausible candidate. Well, uh, All right, Sergeant Porter is going to try to outdo him here. Sergeant John Porter joined the Hopkins Police Department in 19, 1992 after serving in the town of Upton for three years and has a combined 26 years of experience. Sergeant Porter is a graduate, graduate of Westfield State University where he holds a degree in criminal justice. Sergeant Porter has served as a patrol officer, detectives, SRO, and sergeant while at the HPD. In 1999, Sergeant Porter was tasked with becoming the town's first school resource officer. In that position, he developed and fostered relationships and guidelines that have allowed the program to grow and create alliance with the police and the school, parents, and students. This has only strengthened over time. In July of 2005, Sergeant Porter was promoted to detective. As detective, he worked tirelessly on a multinational homicide investigation, the Entwistle murder. While doing so, he, it saw him working with state, federal, and international police agencies to bring the defendant to justice and closure for the victim's family. In 2007, he was promoted to detective sergeant. As the e evening shift supervisor, Sergeant Porter has been in charge of scheduling for the department, an intricate revamping of outdated policy and guidelines for staffing and time off. Sergeant Porter is an officer in charge of planning and security for the town, including major events such as the Boston Marathon and recently the town's 300th uh, anniversary celebration. Sergeant Porter is assigned the duties of field training coordinator and oversees training and mentoring for all new recruits, recruits as well as training and guidance and support, support for field training officers. He most recently took a role as accreditation manor, excuse me, manager and is tasked with bringing the department in compliance with the rules, regulations, policies, and procedures so that we may achieve this accreditation. Sergeant Porter has completed mid-middle, excuse me, mid-management and strategic planning through Roger Williams and is a recipient of the FBI Leader Trilogy Award. He has been recognized throughout his career by law enforcement as well as his peers as having been MAD Officer of the Year four times, which is a record on HP. <laughs> the Mass Cops President Award twice and the HB, uh, HPD Police Commendation three times and the Medal of Valor for disarming an extremely violent and armed suicidal man 
who, uh, who lit his home on fire and attacked responding officers with a knife. Sergeant Paul. Good evening, Boyd. Thank you for having me. Um, again, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the men and women of Hopkins and PD. I want to thank all of them. Uh, especially want to send a, a thank you out to Lieutenant Wallace, who many people do know that, uh, but when I was growing up, um, was with my mother, single mother, and um, Lieutenant Wallace met me at a very young age, uh, when I was about eight years old, and uh, mentored me and took me under his wing and put up with me with his with a little radar gun and me on my bicycle. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's been an honor to follow him throughout my career and, uh, and hopefully replace him and, and carry on the great things that he's done and, and meant to me. I uh, thank my mom, my wife, and my two wonderful children who are here tonight too also, and I look forward to this new chapter in my career. Fabulous. Great story. Uh, Mr. Catino, question? Yeah, I, I, I just, I, I love that story. And that's, and that's just the, the, the kind of community that, that I love being um, so proud of, being proud of, is that, you know, the relationship that, that you had with the police officer. And then, you know, and then you go and becoming a, a, the first SRO and all of that and passing on, passing the batons on and, and to the great resource officer we have now. And, and to continue that uh, for, for my children and, and, and the rest, is a, it's, it's a great legacy. Thank you, and congratulations. Thank you. I have to admit, um, the school resource officer prob part of my career has probably been the most rewarding so far. Great. Thank you. This is a story. You know, listening to the chief, um, you know, you guys, you guys have both had some incredible accomplishments over your careers. And this town is something uh, that's partially a product of your hard work. And it was mentioned earlier about kind of getting in there and doing the whole community policing and trying to prevent crime before it happens. But, you know, then we also hear, and, and I know that this story isn't exclusive to you, Sergeant Porter, but uh, despite the town, you know, now being looked at as, what was it, the second safest small town in America, which is quite an accomplishment, there's always those darker days that can happen too. And so we've got, we've got a, a police department full of individuals who are not only capable and very good at doing the community policing and preventing crime, but then when something does hit a national spotlight or even something that's smaller that's tragic, uh, you know, they're, they're entirely capable of handling that situation as well with all the professionalism anyone could ask for. So uh, it's, it's a testament to each of you individually. I know the chief is, is uh, relatively new to the department, but I, all I've seen is that same level of professionalism being carried on. And, um, you know, I know we don't get a lot of opportunity to say it other than situations like this. Uh, you know, we, we probably could, make, could and should make more efforts, but we're incredibly proud of you guys. So and thank you. Mr. Mosher. Uh, congratulations. <clears throat> I didn't realize you had that relationship uh, with Lieutenant Wallace. As the town grows, I think that's a good thing to hold on to, you know, try to maintain some of those small town relationships, even as we're not a small town. Uh, it's also great to see the support of other members of the department here for, for both of you. Um, the top of the best, really proud of you guys and absolutely uh, proud of you officers, let me correct myself, and uh, absolutely feel uh, safe and confident and appreciative uh, that you're here taking care of us in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And another great process with a great outcome, and uh, I also I, I couldn't be happier again. I think um, it is nice. I mean, what's nice, really nice, is that you all are very accomplished in your own right, but to reiterate, I mean, you do really reflect upon the entire department and, and, and the, then the other people we have in there who are building just as good resumes coming forward. And I think that's, that's really nice as a community to feel like you can really, um, uh, we've, we've just, we've got a terrific police department. And um, I, I think having you all out there every day really, really shows that to the public. So um, congratulations again. So Chief, any um, final thoughts here? No. Uh, okay. I, I, I You're done. You're ready to roll. See you in the. Uh, okay. It's evident. <laughs> so, we have any further discussion on the board's part, or anyone want to make a motion? I'll move uh, a motion. Okay. Uh, move to appoint Joseph Bennett and Jay Porter the position of lieutenant, the Hopkinton Police Department. 
Second. Okay, we have a motion of a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? President not voting. That's unanimous. You know, when I got my wings, we did blood wings. You put them all about the pan you jammed in your chest. <laughs> Actually, a different badge. Yeah. Oh, wow, it's so on. All right, get a bunch of pictures. Well, Lee looks like MacArthur. We'll get. We'll, we'll, we'll let the families go, and then we'll jump back in. We'll, uh, we'll ruin the last one. Congratulations, guys. All right, one with the board. people. Let's see the love. Just kidding. Just kidding. Thank you. I was just waiting until I, uh... That's what I was going to say. <laughs> oh. oh, no, I was. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, moving on in the agenda here, next item tonight is uh, Old Town Liquors, Reported Administrative Violations and Action Item for the Board. The Board will review an incident report filed by Hopkins and Police Department alleging an administrative violation at Old Town Liquors, 70 Main Street, namely selling alcohol to an intoxicated person. What I would like to do tonight on this item is um, I'd like for the Board to hear uh, uh, the allegation from the chief, preferably, right? Mr. Kamala, his chief's come in. I'd like the board to hear the allegation, like the board to ask questions about it. What well, I think we're coming out of this, what we should do is the board should decide if we want to hold a hearing or not, at which we can make a determination about whether we really um, want to do anything in regard to this. So I don't know if we need to take action tonight. Um, although, again, if people really want to, we could just sort of act. But I, 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 my thought had been tonight get the, get the lay of the land and then, um, and then discuss about how to go forward. Because we need, we need, I'm not we need sure. a lot of information. I think we actually need to have this in a hearing format. Yeah, we need a lot of information. Back in. Yeah. Hi, Chief. How are you? Okay, one of the world's greatest, most awkward segues. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> like Back you to business. To, uh, yeah, so, so I, I was just saying before you walked in, so we have an incident report filed. Um, what I think I was hoping to do tonight was have you um, talk about the allegation. Mm -hmm. I'd like the board to be able to ask you questions, and I think the end game out of this today, Mr. Kamala, would be for the board to decide if we want to hold a hearing at the next meeting. Am I, is that how I, I think we're going to approach this? That is correct. I think we want to give a, okay. do this in a real hearing format. So, um, so Chief, without further ado. Um, uh, figuring that there would be uh, maybe some testimony or something, I brought uh, Sergeant Scott Van Rolten along with me tonight. Okay. He was the officer. Uh, that handled the investigation, if you don't mind. Okay. Good evening, board. Hi. And again, what I just really want to do is hear, hear sort of what happened, and then because again, the, the point of tonight is to decide if we want to actually have a real hearing to, to decide about what we believe and then take any action. Sure. So, uh, so a few weeks ago, we had a uh, call for a hit and run accident. Uh, the officers investigated, uh, found the vehicle um, that was the one that struck the, the reporting party. Uh, upon um, investigation, they um, arrested that operator, and uh, through conversation, it was learned uh, that, and through a reporting party, that that operator had just left um, the liquor store outside, right in front of the police station. Um, the operator was brought in for booking, uh, went through the process, and on her person was uh, the items that she had purchased. We, uh, I then uh, went to the liquor store, interviewed the. Uh, clerk who sold it, um, the liquor to her. Uh, he identified that he did actually uh, sell the liquor, uh, said that she didn't make any statements, just walked in, made the purchase, uh, as she does regularly, and left. I questioned him as to uh, whether he was aware of her intoxication, um, and he again reiterated to me that uh, he had no conversation with her and uh, was unaware that, that she was intoxicated. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Sistari, questions, comments? Um, so uh, was there, was there uh, any type of blood test or breathalyzer uh, that was taken? There was. Taken? And what was the result of that? I'm not sure if I'm supposed to disclose that or not. Okay. I think in the course of investigation. It's still an open case. Okay. So All right. All right. At the time, there was probable cause to make an arrest. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, was there anything, uh, any evidence to verify the timing of the purchase versus the crash? And, and uh, the and crash occurred uh, directly, <coughs> um, actually over there, uh, right at the corner, um, Cedar Street, Main Street. Uh, the vehicle then continued to the package store where the reporting party was talking to us um, and then had left the package store. Uh, and driven a short distance to the residence where officers um, caught up with the vehicle. So that whole process between accident and interaction with the operator, approximately four to five minutes. Okay, and there's no, there's no denial or someone saying any other stories saying, oh, it could have been two hours or this or no, that. No, not or, at all. You know, it was purchased long before. Okay. Um, and you mentioned that this is an open case, so this is not. It's an open to... criminal case on the OUI matter, correct? Okay, so it hasn't gone to court yet. It has not. And, okay, great, thank you. Mr. Mosier. Um, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Catino. 
Um, may I, can I ask if, if the liquor purchased was consumed in that four or five minutes? It was unopened when we, when we took possession of it. Okay. That's it. And the point of so the, and the reason that matters or doesn't is because the the, the the issue is it's illegal to sell alcohol to an intoxicated person. That I mean that's a question, as a statement. I mean is, is correct. That that's the reason why we brought it to the boards. Okay. So the similar to a restaurant overserving right. an individual, a liquor store should not be selling alcohol to an obviously. Okay. Intoxicated. So in the context of why we're here, it's because the liquor license holder is re, one of the obligations is not to sell alcohol to an intoxicated person. And, and doing so is a violation of the license, which is granted at the board's discretion. Correct. Okay. And so whether or not that person is legally intoxicated, uh, as determined in a court of law, I guess, doesn't necessarily matter? Um, as the chief had stated, we had probable cause between field sobriety, what our interaction was with the operator, uh, that they were intoxicated. And um, I, was, I was at the booking. I was not at the, the time of the arrest. Right. Um, but the interaction, the brief interaction I had with the operator, there was obvious signs of intoxication. Okay. Mr. Starr had a follow-up. Just, just one other question. Uh, the person who was uh, working at the liquor store, uh, do we know if that person is TIP certified or not? I do not know. Um, I got the individual's name and uh, information, but as far as finding out whether they are TIP certified or how long they've been working there, I don't, I don't have that information. Okay. Okay. Right. So I think the question for the board is, is, uh, is again, do we, um, do we believe there's enough rationale here to, to hold a hearing in the next couple weeks, in the next meeting, probably December 15th? You're welcome to come up and speak. Yes, um, again, this is really more of a process thing, but you're certainly welcome to come up and speak if you want. Come up, come on to the podium and name an address. And Thank you, board. Thanks, Sergeant. No, you really need to go to the podium because the camera and all. My name is Bill Tetlow, and I own Old Town Liquors. When I was there uh, at the time, the, uh, the person came in and purchased the, the liquor. Um, the person is a regular customer, comes in two or three times a week, always at that time of day. Um, is friendly. Um, I was standing 10 feet away from her when she came in. Uh, she walked in, did what she usually does, opened up the refrigerator, took out a very small uh, one half pint of. Uh, the uh, liqueur, uh, walked over uh, and said hello when she came in. She came in and said, hi, Belle, and took a thing, and I was doing something, I was stocking shelves, and I said hello to her, and she went over, and she put the money out, and the boy said hello and took the money and put it in the register. She said, thank you, and she turned around, she said, have a nice day, and walked out the door. And that all took place in the probably in the matter of, uh, I would say, three minutes. So it would be absolutely impossible for anybody to, I did not, I've been in the liquor business uh, since 1967, uh, owning a restaurant, and uh, uh, <clears throat> I have always been uh, cognizant as to the state of a person, uh, a person's uh, sobriety. And long before uh, the alcohol awareness came in, I always had a policy of um, <clears throat> not serving anyone that I thought would be uh, a hazard on the road. Uh, it's always been a, a personal policy of me. Um, as far as credibility in that store, uh, a good example of that is on Thanksgiving Eve, on Wednesday night, we were going to stay open until 11 o'clock, which our license will allow us to. Um, we had a busy day. We got into about 8.30 at night, and all of a sudden all the kids from college started coming in, and a lot of them had had a little bit too much to drink. A little bit too much to drink. And I said, no, we're not going to do this. And I put a sign on the door. We closed at 9 o'clock at night because I just didn't want to deal with that whole thing. I didn't want to contribute to it. Uh, it's been my policy. There have been many people that have come into the store that, uh, in the nicest way I can, uh, deny them uh, the, the uh, right of, of purchase. And uh, I will always do that. And in this particular case, I don't think the young boy had a clue. And I was standing right there, and I witnessed the whole thing. And when uh, he explained um, that she had been stopped um, or whatever, and uh, the, the liquor had been purchased, I said, there's no way we could have told that at all. There's no way. I mean, it's just practical. It's like, you know, common sense would tell you it was impossible to tell uh, whether or not she was intoxicated. She was the same as she was every day she comes up there. So. Any questions for Mr. Tallow? No, Mr. Chairman. 
That's all I have to say. That's Thank true. you. Thanks, Bill. In defense of, you know, no, I, understand. I have a legal store and I have a reputation, and I've strived to do the correct thing there. I will continue. Right. Well, again, I want to be clear. I, I don't think tonight we're playing to, to make a decision about what to do, if anything, no, about I this. I think what, what we're going to do, what I want to do tonight was get the, get the issue raised, right, because we have an obligation to take this up in a prompt manner. And then I think the board now needs to discuss if we want to actually hold a hearing where we can sort of go through on this, ask the sergeant and the chief some more questions, he let you actually formally get up and say whatever it is you want to say, right, and sort of have some deliberations. So. Anyway, so the, the question over to the board is, does anybody have any questions, or would any, does anybody have any thoughts about how to go forward? I, I yes. have a general question. Um, when is the, the trial date for the person that's charged with the OUI? Could be anywhere between six months and a year from now. Okay, thank you. Maybe we can do anything now. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I think it would be negligent of this board to just let this go at this point. I do think that we need to have uh, some type of uh, more formal um, hearing or public hearing, whatever, to listen to more of the information, more of the evidence. Uh, I also think that uh, it would not serve any useful purpose if we were to hold that hearing prior to a point where we could actually hear you know, what the evidence is. Um, I understand and I respect uh, the police department's position where, uh, you know, it's, it's an open case at this point and so they can't be uh, telling us all the, all the specifics and all the particulars. Uh, but I think that for this board to make any real judgment to, to move forward one way or another, uh, we really need to be able to get more information out of this. Okay, and so does that mean? So I think we should, I think that there, I think that we should plan to have uh, a hearing where we get more information and determine uh, whether any action is taken. However, I think that we need to do it when we're able to get the, the uh, full complement of information from the police department. Okay, meaning about the person's legal, legal, of, legal determination of whether they were? Well, you know, that, that may or may not uh, come into it because people, people often, I guess, you know, probably get off on these things for one reason or another. So but we want to wear a breathalyzer or something? Yeah, yeah. Is that something that becomes public record at some point? A breathalyzer result or some, something, something, some day the board can use to say? I actually only restricted and maybe it's something where we can speak with town council about releasing uh, pertinent information to subject's name, uh, person involved. I think uh, the blood alcohol level might be something that we might be able to uh, procure. Would it, um, so, Chief, just so I understand, do you, do you mean as part of the trial process if it comes to that, or do you mean in advance of that? Does it, does it come think, public during the trial? I think in advance of that we would be able to, for purposes of, you know, investigating this violation, right. give the specific facts okay. uh, without mentioning names, or identifying the uh, suspect, uh, the probable cause that we had, and I believe the blood alcohol level would be, uh, okay. be allowed, but I would just like to the, verify that. The, the only other thing would be if there's, uh, if there's admission that uh, the person, you know, admission on the part of the business mm -hmm. that the person was intoxicated when they were served. All right. Okay. All right, so how about this? Why don't we, um, why don't we see, speak to legal counsel and see what we can learn and when we can learn it? Um, because I do think that the board seems to feel that the, getting some sense of whether or not this person was actually intoxicated mm -hmm. from a whatever, you know, blood alcohol level is probably important to the decision. And so, go ahead. Yeah, but one of the things that I think we have to consider, consider is that there are, you know, um, uh, perfectly functioning or some, uh, semi-functioning alcoholics and, and to the defense of the person selling it, they may have seemed completely sober and, and there was no liquor consumed. We have to find out where this person was actually drinking before they actually got them drunk because I think there's two issues here. Um, right, but, uh, but the only, right, the only one that we're, that we're aware yeah. of though is the, is the liquor store. So you, I, I yeah. hear what you're saying, but I, I don't know that we're right. capable it's, of doing forensic you know, research into, into drinking histories, I think we have to just take what It we should have. also be noted, too, that there are many cases where people are intoxicated who refuse breathalyzer tests, but 
based on the office's training, experience, uh, observations, uh, other indications like strong alcohol, odor of the breath. Uh, there have been many convictions, and uh, and I think as the board, you'd probably be looking at, you know, the probable cause of the officer making the assumption that that person was intoxicated and purchased the alcohol. Okay. Right. So no, the, well, the point I made was the officers actually had more time to determine, you know, if if the if if the person was only in the store for less than three minutes, it's hard to figure out whether or not the person may be intoxicated. I'm TIP certified uh, as, a, as a bartender. And uh, you, when, when a person comes into a bar or a restaurant, you actually have a, a minute or so to, to speak to them and notice it. But the problem I have with that, though, is where do you draw the line, right? I mean, so oh, right. at some point, you just have to say it's, it's not allowed, kind of period. Sorry, sorry but, you know, it, it is what it is. You, some same so, so through the chair, I, I think it's prudent to take this up at the next meeting when we have a better idea of what, um, what can and can be divulged from legal counsel. Yeah. Um, but based on the circumstances, uh, I think our first priority is to look out for the for the safety of the community. Um, from what I've heard, there was sufficient reason to think that uh, this person was intoxicated prior to them leaving the store. Um, but I want to have a better idea of um, what our options are, and also, um, you know, that, uh, information that my peers feel is relevant that they're able to hear that in okay. the appropriate setting. All right. So let's have let's go ahead, Mr. Capallo. Go ahead. Yes, through the chair. I think the question before the board is whether based on the report filed the pol by the police department, you feel that warrants a hearing. Correct. And yes. as part of the hearing, some of the questions that the board is raising now could be addressed then. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Therefore, for tonight, I think the, the, the discussion and the decision should focus on whether a hearing is warranted or not. Agreed, Mr. Mahler. Right. Right. And I think, I think what I'm hearing is the, the point. I, what I'd, I think what we'd all do is I, I don't think there's any opposition to a hearing. So I'd like to put a, plan on having a hearing on the agenda for the next meeting. Um, we'll, ha we'll have it in a formal hearing format. But in advance of that, we need to get with the legal counsel and find out what we can learn from the police department if we have to do an executive session or whatever, we can. We'll, if there's a mechanism to do that, because I do believe that there's some questions on the board we have to see if we can answer, and then either we can answer them or not. But at least when we go into the hearing at the next meeting, we'll have, we'll either know that we'll either know what it, it is, or we'll know that we we're going to have to decide without it for now. Okay. Okay. So that's fair enough. That's all good. Bill, I mean, regardless, I mean, you got it. You got, you know, you're out of strikes. <laughs> you got to. Right. Well, again, you'll have your chance to talk about that at the public hearing, but I will just say that this, this is, this, there can't be any more of this, no matter what. There just can't, this can't go on. Okay. Um, good. Final comments? We're all set? I'm good. Good. All right. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Sergeant Van Alton. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Tonight's uh, next agenda item, marijuana dispensary letter to an action item. <clears throat> The board will hear a brief presentation from ComCan Incorporated regarding a potential medical marijuana dispensary in Hopkinton and request that the selectmen consider signing a letter to the Department of Public Health in support or non-opposition of a dispensary being located within town's permitting districts. So, yes, sir. Chairman, uh, Jamie, could you note in the minutes I'm going to recuse myself and step off the board for this item? Okay, so Thank Mr. Um, motions leave the podium. So... Uh, to frame this out, so medical marijuana law passed last year. There's a there's a um, an opportunity for uh, uh, not for not for profit companies to apply to either have dispensaries or uh, cultivation locations in certain towns. Towns are obligated to set up zoning districts that would that would support those kind of businesses. Hopkinton, as a result of all that, did set up a zoning district that includes. Uh, locations where you can sell medical marijuana. Um, the process includes a trip to the Board of Selectmen because um, each application to go to the state, Ms. Kamal, or legal counsel, tell me if I'm wrong, but each application before, when it goes to the state to get considered has to have from the executive body, which in this case is us, a letter that either, um, either a letter of support or at least a letter of non-opposition to the, to the enterprise being located in town. And if it doesn't have that letter, I believe it doesn't go forward. So, um, so there is an, uh, to the extent that this, 
this can only go forward if we either give a letter that either supports it or does not oppose it. If we do not take any action, um, or obviously if we actively oppose it, then, um, then it doesn't go forth. Mr. Sistari. Before we continue on this direct discussion, uh, is it appropriate? I'm just wondering why we had a board member recuse himself. Uh, I don't think we get to ask. He doesn't have, he's not obligated to tell us. He's not? No. Okay. Are we allowed to ask him if he does, if we want? You can ask him. He's, he's not right. obligated he's to tell us. To yeah. Okay. That's fine. You want to you see if he'll tell or not? No. It's fine. Okay. Good. Uh, so that's where we are. Um, so what I'd like to do is, who's the proponent? Could you all step up to the podium? Could you introduce yourselves? And um, uh, you have a presentation you want to do, if you could do it uh, you know, fairly expeditiously, um, get the questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sometimes we jokingly ask people for samples when they show up on open at store in town, but in this case, we'll, we'll defer. So. Uh, hey, good evening. Um, my name is Ellen Rosenfeld. I'm the president of the uh, board of directors of ComCan Inc. This is my brother Mark Rosenfeld, who is the. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Mark Rosenfeld, I'm uh, chief executive officer of ComCan. With us tonight is uh, Valera Romano, who's our uh, not only our chief compliance officer but our outside counsel that is uh, assisting during the application process with Department of Public Health. So. Let Valeria come up here if you have any questions for me uh, okay. personally. Why don't you go through them. what you got, and then we'll, um, we'll just open fire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I appreciate you taking the time and adding us to the agenda this evening. Um, so quickly, at Valerio Romano. I'm an attorney in Massachusetts, represent uh, a number of medical use of marijuana applicants. I've uh, been working with the program for the last uh, couple of years, really, since it passed here. Um, but. Uh, 109 State Street in Boston, Suite 404, just to get my address. Um, uh, ComCan Inc. is uh, a nonprofit formed under Chapter 180 of Massachusetts law who's applying for uh, medical use of marijuana registrations th uh, throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, they have met with uh, a number of other uh, municipalities throughout the Commonwealth, um, Millis, Medway, and Framingham, and have been provided letters of support or non-opposition from all three of those municipalities to site either a cultivation and processing facility or uh, the actual dispensing a a portion of it. Uh, the way it works quickly in the Commonwealth is that it's a vertically integrated medical use of marijuana model, so each Chapter 180 has to cultivate, process, and dispense the cannabis from within uh, within that organization so there's no outside cultivators selling to dispensaries and whatnot um, all of the applicants that we work with uh, including ComCan Inc we've done thorough background checks on the Department of Public Health does also we background check every single member the people that we're bringing before you are homegrown Massachusetts people uh, who have stellar uh, records in their in their communities and and wish to be responsible corporate citizens here um, so uh, you know mr. chairman uh, uh, please interrupt me if there's if there's anything you need during you know during my discussion. Uh, we have uh, had the opportunity. Yeah, what I'd like to do is to talk about what you want to do, right? Okay. Sort of. I mean, I, I guess I thought you had a presentation going through. Talk I, I, about. I do. Okay. Not a PowerPoint, but just a discussion. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I just want to make sure that it, I, I want to defer to, to you as I, to how you I, want to run the I meeting. I thank you very much, but I, you just run through it what you got, sure. and then we. Um, I think there'll be a lot of questions. Just so you know, Towns Legal Counsel is here just to give us some advice if we need it. So. Um, so ComCan has had the opportunity uh, in prior meetings uh, with Hopkinton to meet with uh, the town manager, with uh, the director of land use planning and permitting, uh, with the director of the Board of Health, with the director of Youth and Family Services, uh, with the chief of police. And, and I know uh, in one meeting that I attended, uh, the, the, assistant to, the operations assistant to the town manager was there as well, uh, Mr. Helen, who's here now. Um, you know, one of the things about the letter of support or non-opposition that just, just to make it clear, it's not actually a regulatory requirement with the Department of Public Health. In November of 2012, the voters of the Commonwealth uh, overwhelmingly passed uh, the medical use of marijuana program, and the, the numbers were actually quite similar in Hopkinton. It was just about 63 percent of the voters here passed, uh, passed the law. And that's, you know, it's, it's a pretty good margin for anything to pass. Um, and that was a five-page law that they passed. It wasn't... Yeah, what, I, what I really want to hear is what you want to do. So 
Okay, thank you, Jim. No, that's great. Well, what, okay. what we're trying to do is get a letter of support or non-opposition, which is like what I wanted to get at, just because there was, you know, some preface as to what exactly the stage of the process is and, and where we are. And it's not actually a regulatory requirement. It is an application requirement for the time being mm -hmm. in the application process that was rolled out now. Uh, in the previous application process under the Patrick administration, it wasn't an actual requirement. Um, so. What we're looking for, really, from, from the board is a letter of support or non-opposition, Mark. Yeah, I think to get to your point, uh, we're going to cultivate, uh, we have a letter of support from uh, the town of Medway for our cultivation facility. Okay. We have three applications pending with the Department of Public Health uh, that correlates to three dispensing locations. Mm -hmm. All three of those locations can be supplied by one cultivation facility. We have a letter of support from Medway where we will cultivate. Mm -hmm. We're designing our uh, cultivation facility right now. We have a letter of support from Millis where uh, we'll dispense one location. We have a letter of support from Framingham where we'll dispense a second location. Mm -hmm. And we're seeking a letter of support or non-opposition. Mm -hmm. makes no difference to the department from the town of Hopkinton for our third and final dispensing mm -hmm. location. And, and again, I, I, want, I, used to, I always go to the board for questions, but just to kind of Get the, get the lay of the land here. So is there actually a, a location you have picked? Do you have a building, a lease, a storefront? Do you have, you know, I, I guess I'm looking for a little tangibility here. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, uh, and sorry. I, no, that's all right. Valeria and I kind of just yeah, move, back, move back and forth. No, it's all good. So uh, Hopkins has a comprehensive bylaw. You have established four uh, zoning districts. Um, we do not. It seems a little backwards, and the, and the regulation doesn't require it for us to um, secure a location at this point. Because in essence, to do that, I would come to you right now with a lease in hand and then hope that you supported my endeavor. Um, even if you did, I would still have several months of paying on that lease before I'm I get a, you know, a provisional registration from the Department of Public Health. Mm -hmm. uh, and then while I build out my cultivation facility and I grow So it's to come to you now with, a, with an actual location is, is kind of reversing the process a little bit. Um, what I can and what I have su uh, supplied already through uh, Mr. Helen mm -hmm. is a letter signed by uh, President of the Board of Directors stating that we're well aware of your Right, your so. zoning bylaw and that we will locate um, within one of your zoning districts. It's important to, to, for everybody from your constituency to know that not only do you have a comprehensive bylaw, but you have, you've established this by special permits, not as of right. Mm -hmm. So this, this application, allowing us to continue on with the application process will ultimately bring us back under your purview or your planning board's purview as a special permit granting authority. Mm -hmm. um, which it, there is every ability at that point to, if we, if we, you know, are non-compliant in any way, to deny the permit at that point. So, providing the letter in no way um, okay. moves us, you know, moves us to completion. Okay. So let me just summarize, and I want, I want to go. I just want to summarize the facts as I understand them, and then let the board ask questions. So you have, um, you're proposing to build, and I guess it's something like you haven't built it up, a, a growing location, a cultivation location in Medway. Yes, sir. And then you've already got two towns, Millis and Framingham, that have signed letters of support. Yes. Okay, so they support it yes. to open essentially a retail sales yes. location there. Similar to a pharmacy. In, in, yeah. in equally undefined locations, right? Sort of just within the zoning. So in so a little a little different there. In Millis, we own. Uh, property on 109 that's zoned appropriately. Okay. We will sure, we will locate there. Um, Framingham. We happen to um, had a, a business colleague that had a location on Route 9 that made sense for us to so you have to secure. There. So you yes. you'd open it in a obviously legally permitted part of town, assuming your application mm -hmm. gets approved to the state. Yes, sir. Okay. And then and then um, I'm not sure it's. Well, I'm going to ask anyway. And then are there plans for other stores? I mean, or is this one cultivation facility just can only handle the three? Uh, so the, the, the maximum allowable by, uh, the, by the statute are three, three. Yeah, okay. three dispensing locations, okay. three applications. Is there anything critical that I missed just from a factual perspective? Okay. So. No, sir. Let me go to the board then and get more questions. Uh, Mr. Catino, you want to start yeah. off? Why Hopkinton? That's you, Mark. Why not? Why not? No. 
Yeah. There. So, in the pipe. Uh, so Hopkinton <laughs> makes a lot of sense for us. So, um, okay. So a, a, a small amount of background on me, um, and you're free to ask more. But uh, I was born at Ellen. I both born and raised in Millis. That's where our office is. That's where we, you know, that's where our day-to-day -day operations are. Uh, I live in Holliston, right? I'm the first street off. Of, I live off of Marshall Street, the you know first first road over the line from Hopkinton. Um, we are cultivating in Medway. We want to stay local. We want to stay with the towns that we're familiar with. Um, we've you know we've built in Hopkinton. My brother used to live in Hopkinton. I'm a board member of the youth hockey program here. Uh, it's a community we're comfortable with. And then more pragmatically, you happen to have phenomenal access to interstate highway systems, right? So you have access, easy access from one of your zoning districts, Thank you, which would put us around the, the South Street area to uh, Route 495. And one of the things that we look for um, is to be in a place where patients can easily access us, right? So we've taken the position that we're not terribly interested in locating in the middle of nowhere in the back of an industrial park and make people, you know, seeking out their medicine come and hunt, hunt for us. Um, you fit well with all of our, in terms of a business perspective, in terms of what we're looking for. And not for nothing, you have a comprehensive bylaw. Somebody spent a, uh, in, a, a lot of time figuring this out. I've gone into communities before that have no bylaw. And it is a much longer uh, education process. So you guys have thought this out, um, and it just makes a lot of sense for us, and hopefully for Hopkinton. So, you know, so w w one of my concerns is how does it stand with with federal law, since it's still illegal, f illegally uh, illegal federally? You know, by by us as a as a board of selectmen in a town, are we? Uh, subject to any censure by the feds by saying, hey, you guys said it was okay to come into your town, even though the state went against it, and so 63% and state the same numbers. Now, I don't want this to become a big referendum that, you know, by, by us, but, you know, am, 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 are we opening ourselves up by showing support to, to council? The town is not. Uh, what, what the federal government's going to do with these facilities is an open question. Correct? Yes. Yeah, so yes, it's your risk. Yeah, that's. I mean, I think that's right. The town is not subjecting themselves to any additional liability by allowing state law uh, to to play out within the town. I mean, there's there's dispensaries in California that are breaking federal law that have gone in front. That the landlords are trying to evict the dispensaries in front of a federal judge, and the federal judge is denying an eviction for somebody who's selling marijuana. I jump into the phone. Oh my gosh, you're the chair. Well, no, I will move. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Can I can I just ask a corollary to that? Because this, sure, I'm, I'm a money guy. This intrigues me. So. Um, uh, uh, the money that uh, oftentimes I've seen that these are done through host community agreements with towns, right? And there's typically some sort of payments to the town, right? Not to be too pejorative, but that's drug money, right? In the feds' eyes. <laughs> and so I wonder, you know, I wonder about just the fact of bringing in money from a federally prohibited activity into a community. Going. How does how does one how does one do that? I mean, I've heard about places like you all can't even get bank accounts because because banks don't want to be censured. So I'm I'm just um, briefly. Can, can, can you just talk to the, the 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 filthy lucre part of this whole thing? Go on. Did you? No, no, no. The, the short answer is we're happy to not provide a community host agreement if that's yeah. something you're not open to. But if I want, I do if have, I'm taking drug money, I want a lot of drug money though. So this is why. So I, I yeah. what I do, and, and Valeria will. We'll, we'll speak to this much more eloquently than I, but I do have a, a, a copy of a, a sample community host agreement that we've entered into, just so you have a, a frame. But how does it? But but, but how, how does the community take money from a federally prohibited from a federal crime? So, <laughs> as a general matter, let me tell you. As a general matter, the DOJ has issued a guidance saying that it's not going to uh, enforce the federal law mm -hmm. against marijuana if it's permitted by the state. Okay. So as a general matter, you know, that policy may change. That's right. a DOJ guidance. Uh, but at the moment, at least, uh, the DOJ has said that they're going to recognize and respect what the states have done. 
But that's a policy, like you said, that's a policy, though. That's, that's a, not a That's a statute. policy. Okay. It, in fact, Go ahead. It, uh, uh, that was a policy really directed at Massachusetts almost. It was issued in August of 2013 by Deputy Attorney General Cole, uh, Holder's right hand. And it was, that was, it was scant days before our application process opened up. And I, you know, the cynic in me might say that, you know, it was the Department of Justice saying, Congressman Delahunt, feel free to apply for medical use of marijuana licenses in the Commonwealth. I, you know, I, so I, I, it was really directed at Mass. It was right at the time that we were opening our thing. And so, okay. yeah. Good enough. So, I, well, I'm torn on this because I was chair of the board that wrote that uh, zoning article. Um, however, I was also on the board that wrote the town vision statement that says where natural resources, facilities, and programs that promote a well-educated and healthy community. And so for me to say in one respect that I, I don't want to see my kids smoking at all or any of that, and then, but then to say, well, you know, marijuana, it's good, it's for, it's, 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 it's for health reasons and all, yet we're about to have a referendum go on to the town ballot, I mean on the state ballot, saying recreational use is okay. And you know, with uh, with uh, accident, with uh, in, driving impaired accidents up 300 percent in Colorado, I, what scares me is that somebody will will buy it here in Hopkinton, try it before they get back into their car, and leaving our, our well located <coughs> town, get into an accident. And so I, it's I don't know. So Mayor just made a statement. I was supposed to ask a question. I apologize, but. I have a hard time supporting it. Well, I, it actually, I mean, it, it does. I mean, I think it's a great question, um, and it's sh shared by, you know, uh, Youth and Family Services. I, I read this, the staff notes uh, to the proposed agenda item this evening, and it's, it's, very, it's shared, shared by, uh, you know, a, 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 an administrative board in, in your town. Um, there's a few issues there. One is the amount of money and effort and time that's put in by any one of these nonprofits to open a dispensary in the Commonwealth. I can promise you that they are not going to let anybody consume cannabis anywhere near their facility, in the parking lot, anywhere near their facility. That's, that's one thing. They'll, the, the, not only the, the, the town, which the Department of Public Health is ultimately deferential to, but the Commonwealth will yank their registration in a heartbeat if any, there's any on-site <laughs> consumption. That, that, you know, and, and that's absolutely true. And, and Steve Chasen, who's the inspections manager for the Department of Public Health, is touring the, the, the few that are open now and, and all the ones that are going to be open, spot inspections, surprise inspections, scheduled inspections, nonstop. I mean, they are on top of everything. Uh, you know, uh, additionally, it, Anything that uh, the police chief uh, Lee wants uh, from uh, Comcan, Comcan's going to work with the police department in this community to, uh, you know, probably to, to the point where the police chief's going to be like, okay, enough, we get it. Uh, you know, so, and that includes making sure that the, if there's any way, you know, the, the labeling on the packaging, if a package is ever found anywhere but other with the patient that purchased that package or the caregiver that purchased it for a patient, then that's going to come back to the patient. We can track by barcode exactly where that package is going to be. So we'll always know to the extent possible where it's, where it's going to be. So, uh, and, and we'll be able to hopefully prevent that, you know, consumption in an illegal manner. I mean, you know, there was, a, there was a hearing tonight about people, you know, abusing substances that are legal in the wrong place in the wrong time. And, you know, Comcam will do everything and it's going to be far more, uh, you know, transparent and open with any board, state, local agency than, than pretty much any other business is. And they just sort of have to be. You know, speaking quickly about the issue with, you know, with youth and kids and whatnot, um, you know, there were uh, the the Institute for the Study of Labor, uh, including, uh, you know, somebody from Montana State University, Hanson University in Oregon, and the University of Colorado in Denver, uh, did a very comprehensive thorough study, which I'd be happy to send you with pages and pages and charts and charts of, of data and whatnot. But it had a few really important conclusions. <coughs> it's about whether uh, high school uh, drug use, marijuana, cocaine, alcohol, goes up or down uh, in areas that have legalized the medical use of marijuana. And it found consistently that there's no increase, and in fact, there's probably a decrease. They said their results are not consistent with the hypothesis that the legalization causes an increase. Uh, 
In fact, estimates from preferred specifications are consistently negative. Uh, when national and state data are combined, legalization of marijuana is associated with a 2.1 percent point decrease in the probability of marijuana use within the past 30 days and a 1.1 percent decrease in the probability of frequent use. This is among high school students. Uh, the estimated relationship between uh, medical marijuana laws and the use of marijuana in school property is consistently negative but never consistently significant. In the combined sample, legalization is associated with a 2.7 percent decrease in the probability of having been offered, sold, or given an illegal drug at school in the past year. So this is, this is not by a normal or Americans for Safe Access or some proponent of medical marijuana or marijuana use or legalization of marijuana. It's an independent study performed by multiple universities with an absurd amount of, of data that's collected from um, the, um, um, I'm sorry, that's connected from uh, local and, and state and uh, the I'm sorry, I have it right here, the, disease, the Committee for Disease Control, I'm sorry. I'll give it to you in one second. Um, yeah, so if it's true that the goal is really to keep adolescents from abusing marijuana, you know, it's better to actually look at the real data than it is to sort of look at, you know, just sort of the stigma and the perception, which is frequently what reality is. Um, so, you know. Well, yeah, well, my, just to follow up, which is my, my, one of my main worries is, uh, is again, um, if the referendum, if, a, if that referendum passes for recreational use next year, does that medical sale um, end up becoming recreational sales also? Uh, and no, it does not. So uh, at the you know there's there's an opportunity you know. You don't need a letter to open a recreational dispensary shop, right? It's not, it's not the same thing. Yeah. So this is a nonprofit under Chapter 180 that's expressly allowed only to provide medicine and educational materials and paraphernalia, vaporizers and whatnot methods. Under, that's under Massachusetts law. That's the way the Department of Public Health is, you know, um, is imposing Chapter 180 on these nonprofits. So they can't sell recreational marijuana. Comcan, Inc., Unless something happens and the legislature changes the, you know, the ballot initiative, Comcan Inc. will never be selling medical marijuana. Uh, recreational. Re excuse me, recreational marijuana. They will be setting, setting, selling medical. That was from the CDC, that data, that that, that study used. Um, so, the co yeah. <laughs> Comcan Inc. won't be selling recreational marijuana. Now, there are two competing ballot initiatives. Uh, and, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with either one of them. Uh, Can I ask you to kind yeah. of, kind of yeah, tighten this up? We got it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think he, and he touched on real quick. So we don't have a plan to, if it does go, if it does go recreational, there's no plan on right now that, that Hopkinton would somehow change into a recreational facility. Comcam will continue to operate three medical marijuana facilities. I presume Hopkinton will be one of them. The other thing that he touched on briefly that you need to know is if the ballot initiative passes that you're referencing, the one that they're talking about that just got, you know, they just submitted the signatures, this process ends. You as a community have provided comprehensive zoning. It, it will, an applicant, similar to myself, will come before the planning board, not before you and not with the community host agreement. They will come before the planning board like any other use that is allowed by special permit. What's ComCan stand for? Commonwealth I, Cannabis. Commonwealth can, Cannabis? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, well, I started out being torn on this. Uh, I'm against this being in town. I voted against it in the statewide ballot. Uh, but I also um, take seriously uh, our commitment to the public and, and uh, upholding what the public's wishes are. And, and uh, as was mentioned in the pr um, presentation, the town did vote uh, about 63% in favor of uh, legalization of medical marijuana. Um, but I also think that it's incumbent upon the board to be forward-looking and try to, uh, I guess, mitigate any, you know, community dangers as we move forward or any unforeseen circumstances. And one has been mentioned about the ballot and, uh, you know, it, it's likely that next November there's going to be a ballot at the state level to uh, legalize recreational use. Um, despite, you know, your word that you're not planning on converting over to recreational, I mean, uh, that I, I, can't, I can't vote tonight, you know, using that as any type of uh, factor. Um, I think that eventually, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to kid myself or anybody else. 
I think that it's probably going to be, uh, you know, legalized at a, uh, for recreational use, and there are going to be, uh, you know, marijuana stores like there are liquor stores. Um, but liquor stores at that point would probably be more regulated than our, our, uh, than marijuana stores. Uh, right now, there are state limitations based on population in terms of how many liquor stores we can have in town. And so I think that we need to take step back and take a look at this. Um, this is something that, in my opinion, hasn't really matured at the statewide level in terms of people seeing the effects of the com on the communities and also any loopholes that, uh, that are possibly in the laws themselves. And we also need to see what's coming down the road in terms of recreational use and what those laws are looking like uh, before we go and start opening the door. Uh, you know, again, I think that it's something that we need to be considering because the people in town um, have, have, you know, made a statement uh, at the ballot. Uh, but I think that we need to be responsible and we need to make sure that we have uh, any legal uh, appropriate precautions in place so that we can uh, limit, limit uh, how widespread this gets. Um, how do you make money? It's a nonprofit. You can, you've said that several times. How, what's the economic? What's the economic to your business? How do you? How, you know. So it's not a public charity. I get that part. It's yeah, not a five hundred one c three. It's just a, it's a nonprofit under Mass Law. So the money has to be spent for the nonprofit purpose, which is to provide medicine and educational materials to patients. You keep saying that, but I mean, it, so it, they, I assume it's dramatically profitable as a business, right? Well, you know. The, the ones in, in other states aren't necessarily so profitable, depending on if you're a smart, smart operator and a smart business person or not, but mm -hmm. these people can't pay themselves dividends. There's no, there's no shares. There's no equity in these things. They're, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they do uh, pay themselves salaries. Um, they make, you know, uh, their great personal expense coming from the Rosenfeld, so they'll have, you know, in, you know, an interest rate that isn't usurious on the money they loan. Um, right, but I, I guess I'm just trying to go to the, it's not a, you keep you've, you said not for profit three or four times, and I just you know like you said I mean the distinction between not for profit and public charities is 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 important, and I just I just want to make clear this is not you know you're not this isn't a public service organization. This well, is it's a, mandated under Mass Law to be a, a nonprofit. Yeah, but that's a legal status, not a not Absolutely. a um, uh, you know a, a, a sort of a moral status. So. Yeah. So I mean, I guess to, to that. I'm not sure it matters. I was but, just kind of well, I just, well, I mean, you most, just you hit it so hard. I felt I felt I had to ask about right. Well, most it. most non I think the I think the the key to realize is that under the medical program we are nonprofits, right? So what that means to me, yeah. we're self-funded. When if and when it does go recreational, and and applicants can give percentage interest away, mm -hmm. money is going to be flooding into Massachusetts, yeah. right? And it's not going to be. It's not going to be Mark and Ellen from Millis. It's going to be a group that's coming in from Colorado or from mm -hmm. Seattle or from wherever they're going to come in from. You know, there's Canadian money out there now. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a question of who you'd like to be with you, you know, who you'd like to be mm -hmm. part of your community. Um, what, it, what it allows us to do under the medical program is to enter into com community host agreements, is to give back, is to reinvest in, in the business. Um, we will... You know, well, the board doesn't take a salary. I will take a salary out of this. Um, it is, it is looked over with a magnifying glass to make sure it's not out of whack. Mm. The I, I mentioned we're building our own cultivation facility. We need a special uh, rent appraisal study done to make sure we're not running afoul. We're not siphoning off uh, extra money mm -hmm. from the nonprofit. Yeah. Um, what a, a great many applicants are doing is they're setting up management companies, which if you followed the 2013, 2014 first round of this, you saw a lot of uh, applicants got into sort of trouble with it. What they've That's done, how you extract the money out, I assume, right? What's that? That's how you extract all the capital, because you, yes. you, pay, you, pay, you pay management. Right, we do not have a management. Yeah. We do not have a management team. We're not, Ellen's not, you know, part of a management team that will somehow take 20% off of, right. you know, to give it to her. Yeah. Um, we're, we're in this, you know, we're in this for, I mean, you know, for for the reasons to provide medicine to the to the patients of Massachusetts, we have personal reasons that we're that we decided to enter into this. Um, but yes, the fact that he's hitting that it's a nonprofit, it is, and 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 it's sorted to combat the stereotype that 
these medical use of marijuana programs are coming in and everybody, I'm going to pull up in a Ferrari and the corporation's going to pay for it. They'll pull my registration. Yeah. And Mr. Chairman, really quickly, the Department of Public Health is in fact force, enforcing nonprofit guidance and regulations on all these businesses to actually act like public charities. I, I have a copy of them here and I'll leave them with the board. But you can sell for at whatever price you want, right? You're not price limited. You're not... You're not, you're only, you can sell as much as you grow, whatever price you want to charge, right? You're just yeah, a classic retail like, operation. Just like any other business. So, you, right. So, you're, it's going to be a normal C profit. I mean, again, that, that's sort of outside the bonds. Yeah. I, I'm not sure this really matters. It's neither here nor there. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm interested, so I'm di diving in, but it doesn't well, Prices really... are important, Mr. Chairman, because you yeah. want to keep them somewhere near the black market so that if you have them too low below the black market, somebody yeah. will come in and buy it and go resell it. Right. And if you black have them too high, it, it keeps right. the black market going. Not doing so. yourself any favors when you just talked about how you're going to track it all and not get, let it get diverted. But. Well, that's <laughs> the point. So you keep it near the black market. And, yeah, I understand. You know, and so no, it's happening in Colorado, I know. I, I, yeah. I, I, I'm more. I, real quick, just because you, yeah. you mentioned it, I don't want to keep you off your agenda, but in terms of diversion, so as everybody up here knows, Massachusetts decriminalized up to an ounce, right, for possession. It's a $100 civil penalty. If, if, if myself or anybody in my organization mm -hmm. diverts medical marijuana, the state has instituted a new felony, right? So it's two and a half years and... Up to five. Up to, so yeah. the, the notion that people are going to subject themselves to this is, is sort of silly mm -hmm. when it's decriminalized if you, don't, if you don't push it out of the medical program mm -hmm. and you just have a black market functioning as it's done for decades here where the civil penalty is, is, is almost nothing yeah. to think that it's going to be pushed out from one of our facilities right. and people would open themselves up to that kind of liability. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, so, I mean, you all asked any questions, I guess. Here, here's kind of where I stand on this whole thing. Um, and I have two, two th kind of separate thoughts that are, I guess, are interlinked at some level. First is you all seem like very reasonable people. I think you're reasonable businessmen. I think you got, right, I think you're doing this. Uh, nothing about this strikes me as, you know, strange, right? You just, it's just a, a new product. I, I think my problems are twofold. First is that, unfortunately, the town you're coming to, this just does not fit, I think, our self-image, right? The brand, the, I, I've lived in this town for 20 years. I've been on town boards for 10 years, right? I got kids in the schools. You know, we're, we're, this town has really got a self-image and a brand of family-oriented, outdoor activities, right? The Boston Marathon starts here, which is you know, by far our biggest single day of the year. Um, we have, we're, we have a, we're known for our phenomenal school system. We were just voted number two safest town in the country, right? We got this kind of wholesome, family-ish, friendly um, uh, reputation that we've worked very hard over, well, uh, certainly the last 20 years, but more than that, to build. And my problem is nothing about this enhances that. And I'm not, and, I, and so what I see is I see no upside from, the, from a town's fundamental perspective to having this here. So people don't have to drive to Millis, okay. But I mean, I, 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 see, I see no town benefits and I see town risks that may, you could wait, may or may not be enormous and may get mitigated over time. But there's just no, on a very fundamental basis to me, there's just no benefit to the town to having this here at all. I, I just don't get it. And so that kind of goes to my, to my corollary thought, which is, this is absolutely not something I'm kind of taking on. Mr. Sestari said a minute ago, there's no benefit to being in the lead on this, right? I mean, we like to be a leading edge town, kind of get in front of things. This is, this is one where there's no benefit. You're, you're the first folks through. There's going to be a zillion others. You just told me if marijuana gets approved for recreational use, we're going to have even more people coming through. Um, the state law is unclear. The federal law is unclear. Um, you don't even have, know where you want to go. There, you know, this is, if this becomes like liquor stores someday and it gets, becomes this kind of regulated retail business, then we'll deal with it then. But to get out in front of this just makes absolutely no sense, especially when I'm worried about the brand reputation that's going to be um, uh, sort of damaged potentially as a result of this. There's just, there's, there's just no argument you give me that makes any, that, uh, why this makes any sense to do now. That's a... That's a tough thing for me to answer. That, but you got that, it, I can tell. That, 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 that is a tough thing. <laughs> Let the world loose uh, on me. <laughs> so, I, you one sec. So I, I, will say, I will say just real, real quick, your brand image, right, your, your okay. image, and we've been in the area since, you yeah, know, you've, for, you've for generations, yeah. right? Um, your brand image comes from your, comes from your populace, yeah. right? It's not something that was created by a particular board. It's something that the community, and that's what you're trying to protect. So... 
of your 10,300 registered voters, 8,400 voted in that election, and your I'll your, let you finish. your your brand people, right? Yeah. Your your constituency, 81.1% um, of the eligible voters yeah. supported this. And I knew you were going to go there, so I'm I hope so because it was and pretty low-hanging fruit. And here's why, and here's why it matters: fruits. votes votes are blunt instruments. Votes aren't right. Votes votes say sort of in a broad sense, yes, this makes sense to me. Votes are not at all precision tools. The problem you have: this is the ultimate, I promise you, NIMBY situation, where everybody says, you know what? I, I hear these. These anecdotes, peep, these sick people, they, you know, they have some horrible disease, they smoke marijuana, they can eat, they feel better. I, I, I absolutely 100% agree with that, right? I believe that's all true. I believe the medical benefits have been, have been demonstrated. However, nobody says, I'll vote for it in my own yard. If you, if you had that ballot, if that ballot said, vote for approved marijuana in Massachusetts and put it in the house next to me, you'd have had 100% opposition. Uh, I <laughs> and guess, that's I, the problem. I guess my, my follow-up. The casino's a good example of that. Well, my follow-up. And I appreciate that because I live right over the line. Yeah, I appreciate so we saved you there. That. So, you so know, that's a that's a that's a great example of the do it anywhere else except far away from me. But here's here's my follow up to that, which hopefully you didn't see coming, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I hope you, I you know, that was a very right. well reasoned you know response there. <laughs> so my response to 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 your you know position would be. We're here. Um, you have again over ten thousand registered voters. I am here at a very well publicized public hearing, right? Mm -hmm. It was noted on your agenda. It was uh, broadcast in the Metro West Daily News, the Wicked Local Hopkinton, the Milford Daily News. Even if every person in this room is vehemently opposed, I don't see how that identifies that people don't Bad want argument. it here. That's a great Bad answer argument. as well. I will point out to you, Sally, this is sort of a rocking turnout tonight. <laughs> so, you know, I, Because right? I've been in other towns and no, there's been a, no, nobody ever the B stands thing up is, and says, this is The hard part about sitting in this chair is you have, to, you, have to, you have to listen to what everyone says, but sometimes you have to figure out what everyone really means, right? <laughs> and so, and this is why, right, we get the big money up here. So, so this, so, it, right, the challenge is, I hear everything you say, but at the end of the day, our fundamental job, and we're getting way off track here, is to, is to protect this, this community fun, in all respects, right? And to, and to hear a million disparate voices and actually try to synthesize that into something that solves the community's needs for now and the future, when it, sometimes a lot of those people can't even tell you exactly what that vision is, and oftentimes they can flip. This is why this is a very hard job. This is also why there is no benefit to people like me sitting in this chair, getting in front of things like this, where there's entirely too much evolution to come. And you're, by the way, the first people to ever come in and talk to us about this. I know I am. Okay. And, and, and I can say I can appreciate that. My mother was chairman of the Board of Selectmen in Millis for many years. She was the first female selectman. My brother was a police <laughs> officer in Millis, so okay. I, I understand the police officer's uh, yeah. uh, concerns on this. Uh, we're, by um, history, uh, real estate developers. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that we have appeared before many towns and many communities uh, to propose a subdivision or to propose a new commercial project. Those rooms are packed with people out the door mm -hmm. to complain and to voice their opinion. So to think that people read this, that we were going to be here tonight, and they are vehemently opposed, or they don't know why we're here, and yet they still chose not to show up en masse, I think is very telling in terms of perhaps perhaps the, the community doesn't agree so much that that and, and and they can also, you, we can I also say the converse and that if 80 percent of the voters were actually uh, in favor of this and we're not seeing an onslaught well, of people saying look you've got to do this you I, have to represent the voice right. again of with all due respect people don't okay. people okay, don't we're show getting, up okay this is this is turning into an argument yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I just okay. want to say I just want to say actually one. I enjoy this but no one else does right so that's why I got to stop this I just want to so, say one thing I need to say one okay. thing I need to say one thing people don't come out and support they just don't. People don't write letters, thank you. Yeah. But people come out mm -hmm. against. And for you to s sit there and say, I don't see one benefit to providing medical marijuana to your constituency is hey. incredible. Thank you very much for your one insight. Benefit. I will point out to you, yes. I am providing it in Millis and in Framingham. No, so, you're so not. That's not, right? That's not our problem. Uh, that's just shirk. Okay. That's just shirking your. This is not. That's. I, okay. Now you've stepped over the line. And okay. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I apologize. I, I, I understand. 
just quickly the benefits to Hopkinton because there are a number of them, and I just don't want it to get away. That I will be honest. Twenty and, uh, seconds. I will. Benefits. I will, out of courtesy, let you speak. Thank I you, will Mr. say Chairman. I do feel like uh, you know I've sort of heard the the views of the board, and I don't right. I also have a couple of constituents who'd like to speak and who. Even though it's not a public hearing, I guess I'd like to sort of honor their request as well. So if you could be really tight, very I'd like brief. to let those two folks come to the podium and say what they have to say, and then I think I'd like to wrap this up. Very brief. As, as the board is aware, marijuana, whether in medical form or recreational, you know, it's all marijuana for the most part, is coming one way or the other. The board's aware that it may be here like package stores in a, in a couple of years or not. We don't know for sure. Um, but right now the board has the opportunity. It's not so much getting ahead of it. There has been medical marijuana in, in the United States for practically 20 years now, so it's not totally brand new. But there would be a community host agreement, which would get a, per, a percent of revenue back to the board, back to the town. And that could be significant dollars, which would pay for any mitigation efforts next year when there's a whole bunch open. They're opening quickly. There's no big deal. They can come here without a letter of support or non-opposition. They just open it to any like any legal business, there'll be no community host agreement. Now's the time where the town and the board has the opportunity to command a few hundred thousand dollars a year from the applicant in order to get that mitigation, get more police, get more substance abuse counselors, get whatever they think they, you know, is needed. There's jobs for Hopkinton. This group would promise and guarantee that they would hire locally whenever possible. That you know, that's 15 plus jobs for that one dispensary. These are good paying jobs with benefits. Uh, there's property tax value. In, in another year or two, the co Congress may reschedule cannabis. It won't be Schedule One anymore. It'll be Schedule Two or Three. And then all of a sudden, the IRS will eliminate, you know, uh, the any any opposition to allowing these groups to not get 501c3 status and then there's going to be no property tax real property tax that's going to that's going to evaporate uh, there's local control right so we know that it's people are going to be going to millis people are going to be going to other places the police chief here and the, and the law enforcement here is going to have no opportunity to control any of that. They're not going to know where it's going, who it's coming from, who's delivering it, nothing. You're just not going to know. Right. There's actually home cultivation also. Right now, every medical use of marijuana patient in the Commonwealth can grow in an unregulated grow in their basement without anybody keeping track of it. Every single one, 15,000 plus people. If, this, if uh, medical use of marijuana comes to Hopkinton, the Department of Public Health will not allow any hardship cultivation because they will all have access to a medical marijuana facility right here and will deliver to all of them. So there's a whole bunch of benefits. So it's not that this is just, oh, we're going to let in marijuana into our community. There's actually a whole lot of benefits. And then I think the one that Ellen spoke about sort of vehemently, maybe a little too vehemently, was, you know, was uh, the fact no that we sort of do have an obligation to provide valuable medicine to to the citizenry of the Commonwealth, and I think that that might be, you know, the board's paramount op okay. obligation. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Please come on if you want. If anyone wants to speak, come to the podium. Please make it brief because we've we've gone on a long time about this, and it's not really a public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bob Levinson, 13 Smith Road. Um, I think Mr. Catino hit the issue squarely when he said, why Hopkinton? And there was a rather flippant response, why not Hopkinton? So I'll try to answer that very briefly. Uh, I, being the self-appointed representative of the 37 percent who voted against um, legalizing marijuana for medical reasons, I would propose uh, that if the, the initiative was worded the way you said it, do you support medical marijuana dispensary in Hopkinton, the numbers would be significantly reversed. This is a town that went nuts over a CVS. Now you can repurpose those signs to say no cannabis, but this is a town that does not want this, I would say. Um, I heard it's a community that we are comfortable with, and I would submit this is a community that's not comfortable with this. This is not in keeping with the character of the town. This is not a way to celebrate the 300th anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Claire Wright, 28 Hayden Road. This gentleman has made a number of my points for me. I want to say thank you to the selectmen who have the ideas that you have expressed. Um, I look at you as keepers of the trust for this community. Um, clearly, when this passed at the ballot box, it was voting for medical marijuana statewide, not within this state. This is one thing that you as selectmen have within your power to decide how we want this town to look and develop and if we want this kind of a facility in our town. We did not have the ability to prohibit it outright. We were forced to write zoning that would allow it somewhere in our town. And I, and I 
it's great that we got compliments on how well the law was written. The reason we wrote that law well was not as an invitation, please come to our town. It was to protect ourselves because we understood that if we didn't have a well-crafted zoning bylaw, it could be imposed upon our town anywhere. And we wrote it as protection, not as an invitation. And just recently, this board denied a liquor store permit at the entrance to 495 saying this is not the kind of entry point we want for our town. This is not the way we want our town to look. This is a much bigger thing than that. Please oppose this and keep this out of our town. Um, I want to make one last point which is that this is not the time to debate whether you're for or against medical marijuana because that has already been determined. But at the time of that vote, the information to voters ballot that came, um, booklet that came out in advance of the vote, it had argument for, argument for against. Note, the argument for against that was published in that information booklet to Massachusetts voters was written by the Massachusetts Medical Society. They were voting against this. And in terms of being able to track people that are buying the materials and if they are under the influence, it's virtually impossible. I learned through a drug information uh, program up at our high school, very valuable program. This material stays in one system and you were under the influence of it for up to five days. They said to the kids, the pot you smoke on Saturday affects the test you take on Thursday. One of the effects is judgment. One of the effects is judgment in relation to speed. And um, in terms of motor vehicle safety and safety in our town, this is not something we want to have. Please support the healthy family town that we want we want to have. Thanks, Claire. Um, I didn't read the comments from the chief, but the chief, I don't know if he wants to make them, but the chief, chief had, had submitted some comments as well, essentially reflecting concern, I guess, chief, need to, need to learn more, study further, I guess, would be the right answer. I mean, you don't have to come all the way up if, if you don't, I mean, you're welcome, but you don't have to. Yeah, I, I reached out and I, I think, uh, you know, the fact that, just listening to a few comments here about the branding of the town, you know, it does resonate uh, strongly. But as the chief of police, my concerns would be uh, public safety, uh, the security aspects of it, the uh, possible rise in crime. I'm still doing some research on, the, on those uh, figures with other communities, other states that have these dispensaries, and just the quality of life issues as well that uh, may be factors, uh, things of noise, congestion, traffic, depending on who, you know, how many people are, are using this facility. But the, the big thing is you have two commodities. You have the product of marijuana and you have a cash carry thing. So anytime you have a, a situation like that, you open yourself up for you know, possible robberies. Uh, one thing that the gentleman mentioned, I don't think we had in our discussion, is that you would be delivering as well. There would be deliveries as well. And, and that's uh, another thing that you, that's something we, we'd have to, you know, look into as far as and there's a lot of regulations that go into that where you have two drivers, GPS, things of that nature, because they would be potential targets. So there's a lot to look at. And as I said, the Massachusetts Chiefs Police Association is pretty taking a strong uh, uh, stand against it uh, and many concerns. Okay. Thank you, Chief. A couple other things we got for the record are. Um Ballot question votes. We actually had the results. I don't know if you saw the sheet, but that was given to us earlier tonight. And then also a, an email from uh, a gentleman named Tim Kilduff, who's had a 26.2 Foundation, which is affiliated with the BAA, and um, uh, essentially expressing the same concerns about the brand of the town um, uh, and, and the need and, and sort of going against the, the communities. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, as part of that sheet, I'd also like to point out uh, to the applicants that in 2013 at our annual town meeting, uh, article number 47 was a vote on temporarily restricting facilities uh, as the state allowed us to do. And in that town meeting, it required a two-third majority and it, and it did pass 109 votes to 47 votes. And I think that what that indicates is that the residents of the town uh, while they may have voted in favor of the statewide initiative, 
Um, you know, it indicates that they want to proceed with caution on this, and I think that that's um, the same mindset that I have. Uh, I, you know, again, I voted against it, uh, but it's obvious that it passed the state. There were only two communities in the state where it didn't pass, Lawrence and Menden. Um, so we probably have more coming down the road that we need to prepare for. Uh, but again, I think that uh, we need to move forward with caution and um, and represent the community. Okay, I think um, in terms of what the board does tonight, can we just, I just want to go to the council for a question. So the choices are letter of support or not letter of support, letter of non-opposition, no letter at all, I guess, right? Or le letter of opposition? Can you, you do that? You don't have to do a letter of opposition, <coughs> but you okay. can vote to oppose if you want to make an affirmative statement like that. Or you don't have to make a motion at all. Okay, so we really have we have I guess four choices in front of us, depending how v, um, how strongly we want to position this. Correct. Okay. And I do have some draft motions if you want to. Yeah, I saw this. three. I, just wanted, I didn't know if there was a fourth, and that's what I wanted to ask about. Yeah, the fourth is just none. But I, I have um, I have a copy here. Oh, you have a printout. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is these are drafts. If you want to do a letter of support, letter of opposition, or what is that, or a vote of opposition. Again, I think in the larger sense, my issue is not necessarily with this particular applicant. It's just with the entire process as a whole. It's just, it's, uh, there's just way too much to figure out. Mm -hmm. um, Could I make a, a brief? Uh, <laughs> really <laughs> brief? We have to really. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm into the mechanics now. So okay, well, it, I mean, my, my question is, it's a five-member board, not that even if the two members here that one of them yeah. is not here and one recused himself. Right. Um, I'm... I think I'm aware of the recusal, and if, if down the road we are able to resolve that, um, the reason that they felt that they couldn't be here, um, I would ask that you know if, if it's if the board so inclines, you're not to not preclude us from seeing you again at some point. In the future. Yeah, right. So right. So there's. So, you know, it doesn't, you know, I don't know if any of this is ever done with prejudice, right? I mean, I, and, and again, I don't even know that I would say that any of this is, is, is specific to you. I mean, there's a lot more detail. We, you know, we heard a brief overview of what you, who you all are and what you do, but we didn't really diligence this, right? I mean, that's part of the issue, too, is we, you know, there's other people. We sort of need to, need to look at other folks. The point I'm trying to make here is these motions, more or less, none of these prejudice you from ever coming back to us again. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think that's... The, I mean, one of these does, the opposition does actually oppose, but it's, it opposes your application, not you as, a, as an applicant. So there's no... I don't know how to differentiate from a future application. Well, it just but says yeah, vote to oppose your application. So, you know, I mean, you, nothing about this would prevent you from coming back to the town if you want to. Nothing would also indicate we change our mind. But, you know, the other thing is if, with regard to your concern about the, the missing member who, whose status we don't know, Motions take two people to make them. The chairman doesn't make motions, right? So, so you're going to have a sense of, of whether the majority would, would be there anyway, mm -hmm. just mathematically. Anyway, so do we have, um, does anyone, so we have four choices, support, non-support, do nothing, uh, uh, or actively oppose the application. So, um, uh, Chair Lantan, any motions that anyone cares to make? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that the board vote to actively oppose this application. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, do you want to use, do you, do you just want to yeah, that's, that's, say it that way? Or? That's, that's fine. fine. Um, that's good enough? Okay, yeah, that's, that's fine. Enough. It's good. It's good. You don't have to change it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, any further discussion on this? I, yeah, I'd like to say that, that the, 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 there is a compelling argument, and that's to, to the chairman's um, uh, note to you that, that, would, that we're opposing this application at this time, is because you, you're the first ones to come before us. And, and yes, this, this scare tactic was working on me that, uh, that when, um, when or if it's uh, legalized uh, or for recreational use that uh, we could be bombarded. But at this point, uh, with, without um, more information, I'd, I'd like to take that chance and, uh, and see, see, get some more information and see what happens, uh, happens in the future. 
Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make it clear as well that I, I support what you had said. You know, this is nothing in opposition to the applicants themselves and, and your plan. Um, I, I do think that given the fluidity of the situation right now with medical marijuana, possible uh, future recreational marijuana, um, this, is, this is something that we need to make sure things are as buttoned up as we can reasonably predict. Uh, for what's coming down the line. Um, and in doing so, you know, again, yeah, there was a statement that once recreational uh, marijuana is approved, then there's not going to be any opportunity to write a letter in opposition or approval. Um, if this state approves something with, with uh, such loose restrictions, if it's easier to open up a medical marijuana store, than it is to open up a liquor store. Um, that is the day that I will put my house on the market and I'll move out of this state. And it's nothing against marijuana either. It's just the fact that <coughs> I think that we as a society, at the very least, we need to categorize it in the same category as liquor. Um, and that's at the very least. And so, you know, there need to be some restrictions uh, that help communities uh, uh, protect themselves from that. And when they yeah, sell it in that's liquor just stores. how I feel. I mean, when they sell it, or when they sell it in in drug stores, you know, like uh, like like OxyContin or some other drugs that are that are that are much needed for for patients. Um, okay. All right. The motion is to oppose the uh, the, uh, the ConCam application to establish a registered medical marijuana dispensary in town. Uh, all in. In favor of that motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? President, I'm voting that's unanimous. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank you. for coming. Next time on the agenda, fiscal year 2017 capital projects review. It's a discussion item. The board will discuss proposed capital projects for the fiscal year 2017 budget with town department heads. Mr. Kamal, over to you. Thank you for coming in tonight. Thank you for coming in tonight. What a gentleman. I forgot you were here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Mr. Kamala. Yes. Um, this issue is on the agenda simply for informational purposes. Based on prior comments um, from the board, I felt it was necessary for department heads to come in and just present uh, big picture overview of their capital requests. So we're not asking the board to take any position. At this point, we're simply giving the board a heads up as to what capital articles the town manager will be reviewing with the department heads. Take it away. Okay. Um, we, we have at least uh, three department heads who are here tonight to share their capital articles information with the board. We'll start with the police chief. Two tanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, th through you. Um, nothing big this year. We're just uh, doing our regular <laughs> replacement. <laughs> Thank you for that lieutenant spot. We're moving on to the, a couple replacement of cruises, uh, replacing two frontline cruises necessary for all uh, police related services following uh, past business practices. Uh, preventing high maintenance costs and to obtain the highest trade value based upon the department's preventative maintenance schedule. It's determined that the frontline cruisers will be replaced every two years from the, uh, for the most cost effective measures. And that's our approximately uh, 80,000 miles mm -hmm. by the time July comes along. Okay. That's it? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Not for hours or anything. Yeah. Um, Next is the uh, fire chief. Fire truck's always easy. So. Fire chief, last time into the fire here, so, so as it were. Last time in, 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 into the firing line, as it were. So, so. Yep. Very good. Uh, good evening. Through the chair, we have uh, five articles to put forward this year. Uh, 
One is our annual replacement of our PPE, which is the personal protective equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, we have 10-year lifespan. Everyone gets two sets, and we buy five sets a year, and at the 10 years, they all get replaced. Uh, the town manager has been very good. This is like our third or fourth year that we've been in this project. Uh, the next one is the uh, public safety radio interoperability and safety initiative. Uh, this is a, a kind of tag team. I think Chief Lee might have left. Uh, on the north side, we've had some uh, extreme problems with radio communications, getting out and getting in. Uh, we did a three-alarm fire at your last town meeting in Carbonis, and I was outside the building. Guys were inside because of where we were. Uh, we couldn't listen, or I couldn't hear messages from inside, and vice versa. And with all the build-off going on the northwest corner, we're going to be going uh, below grade in the cellars of those buildings. It's going to be on a tower that's very near that up high, and it, you know, will enhance the communications and interoperability of both the police and fire. So that's something that we'll, uh, that we'll be uh, bringing forward as we move forward. Uh, the next one is, a, uh, is in our 10-year capital plan. is a vehicle replacement of a, uh, the inspector's car. It's a 2002 Ford Explorer. We want to get the same type of vehicle. Uh, it includes radios, lighting, uh, the uh, MDT, like that. Uh, very simple. It was in the process last year. It should have been replaced last year, but for some reason it didn't get through, so we bring it forward again. Uh, there's a replacement of a thermal imaging camera. Uh, and I'm drawing a blank on my last one here. Let me just find it. Excuse me. Oh, a stretcher. Is, is to, uh, a power stretcher. Uh, we're going into the apartments a lot, and uh, in, it's just an upgrade of a stretcher that we've had for 15 years. Helps uh, up and down the stairs, uh, power lifts, and gets into the ambulance easier. With the, on multiple calls, we've got less people going. So this helps us with the less people that it raises on its own. Oh, well, that's power. what it is. It's like, DeWalt, oh. it's like a real fancy DeWalt battery in it. Got it. A little bit of money, but it's like uh, that was our five that we want to move forward for FY17. Thanks, Chief. Anybody any questions? Thanks, any questions? No. Good. Thank you, Chief. Yeah. Uh, next, Board of Health Director, Ed Wittenen. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, Board of Health is interested in finally getting our records uh, electronically scanned in so we can provide uh, access for not only our department but the variety of uh, permitting uh, departments that we have. Uh, our files are not in the office. They're in the basement, so it makes it a difficult back and forth. But we started this initiative back when I started uh, almost eight years ago and we're still uh, taking our baby steps. So we're hoping that uh, with this fiscal year, we could be embark on uh, actually beginning this program and build from here. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Okay, questions? Can we say those records are historic and take money out of the community preservation account? <laughs> <laughs> Never know. <laughs> Anything else, Mr. Kamal? <laughs> <Good thought. laughs> yes. <laughs> And thanks to Mr. Sestari for the wonderful funding source suggestion. Next. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, was, I was hoping we weren't going to buy any no rusty trucks this year. So. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Unfortunately, we building. do. We do. Members of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, we have three vehicles that we're looking to replace this year. The first one is a 2005 Ford Explorer, which is used on a daily basis, 24-7, by the highway manager. Uh, it's got extensive rotting in the frame and the body, and it's got 102,000 miles on it. Uh, the next is uh, one of our frontline vehicles. It's a one-ton pickup truck. It's a 2006. It's got 161,000 miles on it. So we believe that we've gotten the, the life out of that, that all the life out of it that we can. Uh, the last vehicle is a 2002 International Dump Truck. Uh, this vehicle uh, is one of our main large plow vehicles, sanding vehicle. Um, it has uh, extensive rotting in the frame as well, so we're lo looking to replace that vehicle. And then we have four water projects. Uh, the first one is uh, an ongoing maintenance program that we began of replacing uh, the worst section of water main in town, and uh, we're looking to replace a section on Hayden Row uh, out towards uh, College Street intersection. It actually is affecting the water quality in that area. Doesn't make it poor water quality, 
but it's bringing up some some issues that we'd we'd rather not uh, go down that road. Uh, the next one is a pilot program for biological filtration of the water coming out of wells four and five. If you recall, wells four and five, they have high iron and manganese. We can't use those in the summer. So if we can do a, a, a biological biological filtration, excuse me, that will help reduce our dependency on purchased water from Ashland. Uh, the third one is the construction of the uh, Grove Street water tank, the one that we are currently designing. And the last one is uh, <coughs> water source of supply. Uh, that's our partnership with the town of Ashland as they look to interconnect with the MWRA. How much is the water tank? Uh, the water tank is $1.275 million. Is that the biggest ticket item? Yes. What's, um, what's changed with Ashland since last year? Oh, what are looking at, Joe? Yeah, um, <laughs> a couple of things to, to report. Since last year, there was a town meeting vote in Ashland that did authorize uh, the town to, hmm. to, 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 to move forward investigating the, the MWRA connection. Uh, that vote did not actually appropriate monies that are required for that to happen. Um, I believe from my discussions with, the, uh, with, the, with my counterpart in Ashland as well as uh, John's counterpart uh, is that, that that would depend on a subsequent vote. Um, we also have had uh, preliminary conversations in terms of how the town of Hopkinton could review the existing contract with Ashland to take advantage of this opportunity if it does come forward. And we'll have more clarity on that before we vote to spend the money? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions for the DPW director? Thanks, John. Thank you very much, Shoma. Yeah. And then finally, um, there will be a routine request from the Land Use Department asking for funds to support the program that the Board of Selectmen approved uh, in relation to street acceptances. Uh, I am also um, happy to identify the following streets that will be considered uh, in FY17 uh, for acceptance. Connelly Hill Road, Carroll N Drive, Valleywood Road, Kerry Lane. Three of these streets are a result of the survey work that this board approved for funding in the last year. Okay. How many we got left? Yeah. So we're making progress towards addressing that uh, unaccepted street uh, issue. Can we do more? How many do we have left? We have a lot left. Um, I don't have the exact number actually, here. Actually, not that bad. We're I mean, actually doing really? very well. Yeah. yeah, we're doing very well. I think well. we have 20 left. Uh, I don't think it's that high. I'll oh, really? Yeah. Check, I, I'll but I think, I think doing five, I think, is within the range that we've, yeah. right. we've funded in the past years. Fair enough. Okay. As long as we do it based on a dollar number. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Any questions about that? Uh, Ms. Kamal, the camp. Uh, are, are these, we talked about redoing it, right, because it's old now and things have changed. Not, none of this, not much of this stuff that's talked about wasn't on the capital asset management plan. Are we, are we going to, is that gone by the wayside, I guess? Or are we going to redo that or? No, no, not necessarily. Uh, I've had some preliminary conversations with, uh, with Dave. Mm. Uh, Dave is always very creative. Uh, I did pose the question, hey, Dave, how come there are no camp projects that are coming through in FY17? His response was twofold. Number one, Norman, I had the message from the Board of Selectmen regarding what needs to move forward. Number two, uh, he has found ways to move forward some of the projects that were identified in camp uh, by funding them through his operating budget. Right, but I, but I think the whole concept behind camp was to make sure that, A, we looked out years ahead with the capital projects, and, B, we didn't let things decay by virtue of not appropriating money when things were tight. This is exactly why we should be adhering to camp, in my opinion, because money's right, money's getting tight, and, and this is when you're tempted to, to kind of cheat and not do something you need to do for a couple of years. So I just want to make sure that we're not falling off that. That's why I think camp was a good sort of uh, mechanism for forcing us to, to know what we had to deal with on a period of time. So I just, make sure, I just want to make sure we're not throwing it away, because I think the rationale was strong. Yeah. We're not throwing it away. The, the, the last part to my answer is, remember, as part of the funding um, in the FY16 budget, there was money set aside for um, 
PPC mm. and the facilities department to do some detailed studies okay. on some buildings. As a result of those studies, um, mm. we are expecting to receive some update or okay. recommendation from the PPC. I just think it'd be good if we had if somebody went off and and revisited that thing and and a kept it going because it has a good rationale and b updated it as part of the process. And Mr. Mosier, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. I'd like to see the whole thing in its entirety, in and make sure that we're not missing and that we're on track, um, not just bits and pieces of it. So nothing against Dave. I think he's done. A, I'm, I'm sure he's doing a terrific job of finding alternate ways to get all the money. <laughs> but I just, this is the time when I worry about us missing something, not doing something, whatever. And we, and we need to uh, be truthful. Okay. Questions? On anything, else? anything else, Mr. Kamal, on the capital budgets? If I. Um, I did have a conversation with the school su superintendent. They're still working to get that on putting together a list that they will present in the future to the Board of Selectmen for okay. discussion. Good. Layers on reports. Mr. Mosier. Uh, nothing, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sistari. Nothing. Mr. Catino. Nothing. Okay. Uh, and over the town manager's report, Mr. Kamalo. Just wrapped it up. That's it. All right. Future board agenda items, Mr. Catino. Uh, nothing at this time. Mr. Mosier. I'm good. And Mrs. Sestari. All set. Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. Second. second. Motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, that's unanimous. Good night, everybody.